This is the Open University. Sex. Sexagenarian. Not quite such a sexy word, sexagenarian. It means a 60-year-old or someone in their 60s, and I've uh, just turned 60 today, and it's a kind of uh, a very strange feeling, but it's just a number. It's not a feeling. Um, I don't feel any different than I did yesterday at the age of 59, which I've just read somebody on uh, Facebook saying that uh, 59 is the average age of a festival headliner in Britain in 2020. Um, so I would have fitted right in yesterday as a festival headliner. Um, this weird and dying art form which I chose um, of pop music, obviously, is cresting if, if that's the average age of performers. Imagine in 1969 it would have been um, 25 or something. Yeah, I'm a sexagenarian, a sexy sexagenarian, a silver fox. You can refer to me now as a silver fox. And um, this is a furoshiki bag. It's a bag made with a square of fabric. Um, and it's the, the only birthday present I've received so far and the only one I want, really, which is um, my girlfriend's present to me. And it's, um, I suppose it might be a nice symbol of um, <clears throat> travelling light. The things I have accumulated <laughs> during these six decades, being able to fit in this bag. Um, as someone who's born in a year with a zero after it, 1960, it's, it's been quite tidy for me. Uh, also, my dad was born in 1930, so it was quite tidy and easy for me to to organise his life into decades. And this is what I've done in Niche, my um, memoir, which is coming out in July uh, through Farrah Strauss and Giroux. Um, there's a, basically a chapter for each decade of my life, and that's how I I think of, of those decades. I'm very happy to have been through the 60s, to have been alive in the 60s, because I very much identify with the kind of politics and the kind of... Um, culture that the 60s produced. You know, I'm not overtly hippy-dippy, but I am a a tender-minded person formed by the 1960s as I experienced them in Britain. Also by the 70s quite a lot, uh, the kind of plastic, tacky, uh, bad taste side of the 70s as much as it's... um, uh, it bruised utopianism because of course the the oil crisis came along and the beginning of the sort of ecological concerns that we have very much to this day started in the 70s people started to get concerned about air pollution water pollution um, overpopulation and things like that so um, we're still very much in that phase as far as I'm concerned but what I can't identify with really is anything that happened post 1979 which is this whole neoliberal swing and the Reagan Thatcher years and so I became deeply alienated in in chapter three (laughs) you'll have to read all about it Um, it's not so much about my political life or thoughts the book when it comes out I think it's more about personal life being the important thing and um, personal life is the important thing health it's important to keep your health to become wise I don't know if I've become wise I I think I might have um, sort of rote anecdotes lined up for any given topic you might throw at me now Um, but I don't know uh, am I really wise I think I've probably concentrated more on preserving my inner child the only um, public I mean I'm quietly satisfied with the status I have I'm enjoying not being famous uh, as I've told you before it's kind of fantastic to be underrated and to be obscure uh, there is one festschrift type thing happening, which is a, a Munich public radio station is doing a little reportage on me, a five-minute uh, thing about my life and my cultural achievements at uh, five o'clock, I think, in German time. Vor 20 Jahren hat Moms das visionäre Bon Mot geprägt. In Zukunft werde jeder für 15 Leute berühmt sein. Um, and um, that's it. There's no kind of uh, fanfares and uh, one person on Twitter, I think, noticed that I turned 60. Nobody's noticed on Facebook yet because I haven't uh, publicized it there. So um, I'm enjoying the, the sort of absolutely slipping under the radar quality of it. Um, I don't have to do a Madison Square Garden concert or an Albert Hall concert to uh, 
to talk about my age and draw attention to it. Uh, really, I'm very happy not to draw attention to it. I think once once you're past 35, you, you pay less and less attention to your birthdays. And by the time you get to about 45, you start concealing them. So I think I'm very much in that uh, phase. And my, my health is, um, is fine. Um, occasional palpitations of the heart and stuff like that, but um, that's because life is exciting. And um, wisdom, I'm not sure... I'm really not sure if I'm wise. Um, I think I'm definitely satisfied. I have a, a sort of glow of satisfaction in the background, which I don't think you get until a certain age, a warm glow of... Um, I feel like I've had a moderate degree of success just being able to, you know, do what I do all my life. And um, the book kind of seals it. I'm a bit worried I'll get lazy now and just not, not do very much. Um um, but knowing me, I'll, I'll have a restless manic energy, which will continue to manifest itself in uh, in records. Actually, I thought just last night I was thinking I should do the 2020 album from Momus should be called um, Vivid, because I imagined when David Bowie was an old man uh, and retired and and basically was also enjoying obscurity and going under the radar uh, after his heart attack uh, at the age of 57, he. Um, I, I had this dream that he'd made this album called uh, Vivid Old Man and um, it presaged his 2013 return. I kind of thought he might come back after 10 years because Braille had come back after 10 years. And um, um, I was kind of right, although it wasn't called Vivid Old Man, but I was thinking I should call uh, my next record Vivid because I, I want pungent and vivid experiences. Um, not that pungent, though. I want them to be comfortably pungent and vivid. Uh, quality not quantity um and um yeah i want to continue to be interesting uh, and to interest myself um i do think about making a <laughs> a microtonal next album because i i love the sound of microtonal music and there are some amazing keyboards that look as if they were either imported from space or, or designed for a rudolf steiner community um maybe i should join a rudolf steiner community or maybe i should start doing drugs i don't know there are all these things you can do after the age of 60 Aldous Huxley famously um, died while tripping on acid. Uh, <laughs> all these things one promises. One puts on one's bucket list, die while tripping on acid. That's definitely the last item on one's bucket list. Um, I've never really had a, never had a bucket list. Um, I don't have a song that I want to be played at my funeral. Very sadly, I mean, there are people on my um, Facebook um, friends list who are dying currently um, in their 50s. You know, this is... Even if one is in good health oneself, uh, one can't help but notice that this is the kind of sniper's alley, I've heard it described. The 50s, one's 50s, if one is a male, is a kind of sniper's alley where maybe one in 500 or, you know, has a health problem, a serious health problem, and gets sniped at by um, the uh, advanced troops of death. So um, even if one is not that unlucky person oneself, one is aware of it and saddened by it happening around. I'm not going to make any Martin Amos um, type pronounce, pronouncements about um, the great black dawn which starts to rise in the in the east but uh, you know I'm I, I'm pretty nonchalant about it. <laughs> Is that how you pronounce nonchalant? Nonchalant about it and um, you know about death because I won't be around to experience death. It's not really a concern of mine. Um, my legacy, I'm not, I don't particularly care about my legacy, really. Um, I like that people are talking about me. I like that there's a background chatter on Twitter or wherever. Um, I like that I've outlived the people who didn't talk about me, the John Peels and the enemies and all the rest of it. Um, you know, blessed be their memories and they, they, they educated me, both of them, in their way, but um, they didn't ever really champion my work and that still is a, it's a bit of a sadness for me um but you know and there's no there's no momus divider if i go into what's left of the record shops you know uh i can't i can find dividers for my bloody valentine but not for momus so you know in some senses i must have failed but at the same time i'm on spotify and you, new young listeners are coming along uh and also it's the kind of material which um 
which lasts because it uh, appeals to intelligent people and to creative people. And that tends to be, you know, the long-term view of uh, cultural achievement tends to be dictated by people, quite a minority, a small minority of people who really believe, you know, in things and believe in, in, in um, concision and good writing and all the rest of it. So, I, you know, I do have faith that people will continue to listen. A small group of people will continue to listen. Unfortunately, the majority of people, you know, I just read the shocking fact recently that um, the average reading age in Britain is nine years old. Uh, the Guardian, for instance, is a, a 14 years old reading level. My niche, I, there, is a, there are websites where you can actually drop in a sample of prose and find out what the reading age of that prose is. Uh, it's very windy here just now. It's been incredibly windy for three days now. These winds of uh, 50 kilometres per hour or more, which is the, the remnant of this storm which just passed through through the UK. Unfortunately, here in Paris, we get the, the sort of the garbage disposal weather, you know, the, the UK's weather thrown out eastwards. Um, so um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's been a bit uh, shitty, but, but there, are, there are blue chunks, bits of blue sky that come through as well. I'm going to disburden myself of my very modest possessions as I may have to do in real life, because I'm, and my building, as I told you last time, in Berlin has been sold to a Viennese company. I think it's because there's a rent strike, another rent strike, a rent freeze, which has been passed by the very enlightened local government in Berlin to um, stop, you know, overheating in the property market in the city. Um, very well intentioned, but it has meant that the more unscrupulous landlords have decided that it's just not worth continuing to rent. Um, and they're doing everything they can to sell and to, um, you know, upgrade buildings in order to scalp when it comes to charging rents. So I think it, it may well be a case of that. And um, I may well be out of my ear and have to look for a storage space or, you know, may, may move to Paris permanently. Um, I, I'm enjoying very much being here. Um, but I also want to travel later this year a lot. Yeah, so I'm... I, <laughs> I'm just gadding about in, in Paris, um, trying to avoid flying again this year, the Fligscam thing. Uh, probably launch off to Scotland to see my mother in, in the next couple of weeks. And um, there'll be Valentine's Day and, gosh, all the trivia of the calendar. I, 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 don't, know, um, <laughs> I don't know what else I can tell you. I'm going to have dinner tonight with uh, some close friends, Tug and his girlfriend, um, in a new Japanese restaurant, which has opened here. And uh, let's see, what's... Uh, this is something uh, I could talk about. This um, this is a volume called... Um, uh, by Yuichi Yokoyama called Voyage. And I love Yuichi Yokoyama. He's a sort of mangaka, very unconventional manga artist in Japan. And what I love about him is really that he's he's got this very autistic eye that he draws like an extraterrestrial or a child. And um, there's this kind of non-verbal emphasis. Although he does use the frames, the sort of standard frames of manga, he, um, he sees things that other people just don't see. And he sees this robotic, habit-based life which we live, especially when we're traveling. We're kind of in our imaginations and we're also in, in our habit routines. We have this sort of managerial computer making, getting us from A to B and sort of um, conforming to all the regulations of the, the, the trains and things like that. But also and we have this kind of um, weird fantasy life going on within us and we're seeing other Im, implacid, um, um, impassive faces of other passengers around us and we're knowing that they're also in their own weird fantasy uh, Duam. Uh, and so Yuji Yokoyama, in this volume, he really captures that uh, that sense of traveling and the kind of insanity of traveling. And um, he's great. I, 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 I've said before, and will say again, I would love to make a, uh, a kind of novel which is kind of operating on these, these sorts of lines. I don't know. Maybe I have a, a frustrated autist in me. Um, autism, I think... Uh, High functioning, so-called autism, is is very useful for artists, and it gives it gives you this sort of. I mean, sati. Listen to sati music, for instance, uh, and and there's something autistically 
wonderful in in that music the the sort of the medieval cadences and uh, yeah there is something uh, some refusal to entertain which uh, paradoxically entertains even more than than what is supposedly entertaining um in that and i'm supposed i'm thinking of sati because i just got an email from lawrence crane wishing me a happy birthday um and um he's someone i i knew in the 80s uh, there was a group of us um i guess a kind of salon there was a kind of salon uh, my designer tommy rubluski was a was a, an enthusiastic chef uh he he shot um, for instance the cover of tender pervert and uh gathered around tommy um were um some of the most interesting people of the time there was sort of um uh, Michael Bracewell who who was a novelist at the time and now he's more known for writing about music and art um Lawrence Crane the composer uh, sort of english sati if you like and um Melanie Pappenheim Don Watson Michael Edwards uh, Kafiaka was sort of uh, um peripherally involved and um a whole whole group of people Hamish Bowles you know who now is like a big shot in the fashion world all sorts of people um would just congregate at Tommy's flat and eat Tommy's food and talk to each other sort of network um sort of north american british um crossover thing going on um and uh, Mike Allway also Mike was the originally the one who introduced me to Tommy so um, Mike was instrumental there as well but uh, it was a really um and and now I just um I got a message from Michael Bracewell uh just uh, uh via a mutual friend recently I haven't really seen a lot of these people since since the 80s but um it's kind of fascinating I think it's one of the interesting things about being this age is is just having uh so many rich memories of you being able to turn back the um the uh, parchment and and say well in the 80s I was in London and I was with those people and then in the 90s I was in Paris with a whole bunch of other people you know Edouard Baer Ariel Witzman uh, Bertrand Bogola uh, all these people so you know this is really what my my book um, is is like it's a sort of um, city hopping <laughs> white knuckle ride you know um through all these different scenes sometimes it's it's sort of the fashion world sometimes it's the art world sometimes it's music um and also different classes you know i've been been sort of obviously i come from a fairly bourgeois background uh but i didn't want to really hang out with the people i'd gone to school with and so when i went to university i hung out mostly with art students and uh, it's a, i don't know creativity is a weirdly classless thing or at least it was when i was growing up um it was a bit like like forming a band with people who'd gone to you know working class schools and uh, all that stuff it was a bit like national service had been in my father's generation you know it was a way to meet all the ranks and all the classes and all the you know britain is still a deeply even more so stratified society with all sorts of resentments but also respect between the classes there's this kind of weird tension which just now is very toxic um because of you know the politics identity politics essentially and the english national movement which is called brexit um is a, a lot of toxic um people basically um you know gilding their own power by subdividing other groups against each other so a lot of division and toxicity but um yeah a career in the arts for me was a way to escape from my the narrow class origins that i'd had and um to do something more interesting and meet meet interesting people from all over the world and yeah dot 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 so uh, you know in some parts of obviously some parts of it are in Tokyo and <laughs> it's a story which happens all over and which is kind of a kind of a crazy paving or a <laughs> a mosaic which i've put together partly in a willed way you put, you put your life together like a work of art um or like you know choosing colors that go nicely together like the the red uh, alessi plisse kettle uh, against the uh, yellow cup uh, mug from um, japanese bookstore here and um but also there's this sort of unintentional and accidental and un anticipatable <laughs> unpredictable side of your life which is just things that happen which are bigger than you you know and i i see a lot of those things happening now as well obviously 
Coronavirus really worries me um, because uh, it seems to be another nail in the coffin of the freedom which I've identified in tourism. Obviously, there's the other side of tourism and the sort of, you know, Airbnb increasing people's rents and uh, um, private companies taking over Edinburgh uh, uh, at the festival and at Hugmanay, all that stuff we've talked about before. But I'm very much in favour of tourism as a last resort of freedom, a kind of sans-papier uh, existence where you can drift through the world as a flaneur, make a kind of derive through the world, enjoying the planet. Pleasure is obviously at the core of tourism. Spending money for experiences and for pleasure, not for anything tangible, not for an investment, in, unless you use investment in the most metaphorical sense. And I see coronavirus as the biggest threat so far. You know, there's, there's been a backlash anyway against tourist touristification, as, as we now have to call it, uh, which is one of these weasel words, a bit like sexualization, you know, as if people can be sexualized when they're already entirely sexual creatures as you know we're already tourists and flaneurs in the world uh so i don't believe that, that we can be touristified um but of course economies can be touristified and we've seen that in japan especially there's been a huge touristification of the japanese economy and and that's now taking a major hit i saw a vlogger the other day saying that she'd been laid off from a job in a pharmacy in osaka because of the lack of Chinese tourists, because Chinese, there's a huge presence of Chinese tourists in Osaka, and one of the things they do is they buy up drugs, which are cheaper in Japan than in China, take them home and sell them for a profit. So the pharmacies were doing very well uh, until this coronavirus thing. So it's very worrying, the idea of um, <clears throat> there being a sort of military-style uh, restriction, um, a curfew-type restriction, on uh, movement. Free movement, of course, has been removed since I last spoke to you, has been removed from me. Um, well, it's not because we're in the transition period, but uh, Britain has Brexited. Um, so I have a, a scarce few months, the dwindling months of that freedom of movement, um, in which I can, you know, again, again, without a huge amount of paperwork and hassle, um, live where I want in Europe. So I, I'm... There's a dull resentment in the background of everything I'm seeing on the le on that level, the level of politics, the level of global health and all the rest of it. Bloody pain. Um, but there are f fantastic things as well, like finding a new museum. I, 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 I went to the Natural History Museum this last weekend, and uh, that's got... S I didn't realise there's another branch of it. I'd seen the major building in the Jardin des Plantes, but there's uh, another... The, the, paleological department there's the thing that they call the gallery of evolution which is the main building but then there's the second main building which is more like a research a 19th century research museum about um bones you know dinosaur they have dinosaur bones and all sorts of fetuses in jars and it's got a, a sort of a goth like fascination um to see all that stuff and it's a beautiful building and it's not been ruined by any kind of modernization uh, or upgrading or kind of trendy exhibit, you know, interactive exhibits and all that bullshit. It's just a fantastically atmospheric building. Um, feels like a, something, an episode in Tintin would, would happen in, would unfold in. Tintin very much my um, my fashion pin-up, as you probably have <laughs> gathered um, by now. And uh, yeah, I do like that idea of being a boy reporter, even at the age of 60. That's probably a good place to leave it. Goodbye from the boy reporter. Open University.